All right, 7 p.m., time to begin. Uh, it's good to have you all. Um, remember now, uh, as we just spoke with Brother Dan, he and his wife, Joanne, are going to be flying out to uh, California on the 6th uh, to start the uh, procedure for her cancer and hopefully rid it of her body. So you keep her and uh, Dan in mind there, all right, as you see that. Now, the Haley's here. Let me just give you a little update. Uh, we're living downstairs, the lower level, all right? And the uh, gentlemen <clears throat> just have one more partial day of sanding to do upstairs, all right, of the wood. It looks beautiful, by the way. You know, they get it all smooth, filled in the cracks and uh, that, that sort of thing. But boy, when you're sitting down here and they have the uh, sanders going, you know what a jackhammer sounds like when it's breaking up concrete? <laughs> so we ended up going to church this afternoon, out to the church house, I should say. And uh, we uh, cleaned the kitchen, or began to clean the kitchen out there. It hadn't been done in a few years, so we praise the Lord. But what I wanted to tell you was this, uh, the two young men that are doing this, uh, Nick is the owner, and I don't know... Uh, K-H-I-T. How do you say that, Susan? Kit. Kit. He says Kit. Uh, he's from uh, Ukraine. Uh, moved over to Alaska with his parents when he was only three years old. And then, uh, long story short, he ended up in Rochester because he married a girl from here. Uh, but he has this floor business. And you all know who Golisano is? Mr. Golisano? And, uh, a millionaire, at least. A billionaire paychecks. I mean, he has numerous hospitals, children's hospitals around the country, uh, up north. And then the uh, uh, Miss Wegman, the the lady that runs Wegmans now. Her uh, her dad retired, and so she's doing it. And he's done both their homes. And uh, boy, they look they look really nice. So he, he's he's done a good good job of building his his uh, business. But what I wanted to speak to you about, they're both believers. All right, and uh, the one young man, the helper's name is Oleg. Oleg. Oleg, all right. He's also Ukrainian, but uh, he's 23 years old. He's, he's uh, about to leave uh, the business and go be a state trooper. So uh, they train over there in Rome, New York, at a, at a place that I deliver to, of all things. But at any rate, uh, we, got, we got the speaking about... Uh, Universal Reconciliation, and had a real nice time speaking with them. Of course, on the uh, on Nick's part, there was a lot of, he's, he's an Assembly of God kid. Uh, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, you know, and they want to have people burn in hell, but we, we talked to him, and so uh, I told him I'd give him the name of some very simple books that they can get, so tomorrow I'm going to write those out and give them to him, and uh, Oleg already wrote them in his, wrote them down on his phone, so it was it was kind of nice, kind of exciting to talk to somebody about that. So they Nick is also going to take his uh, concordance and look up the word hell and do oh, a study right. on it, a word study. Do a word study on hell, see where it originates and all that. So that's good. All right, so uh, let's go over to First Corinthians chapter two. We've been there for three, four weeks. I don't know how long now, but let's. Uh, Talk about wisdom of the future age for a little bit here tonight and see what we can find here. So 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, I'm going to read verses 6 to 10. Now, all these verses should be familiar to us because we've been looking at them now for a, a number of weeks, okay? And I think you'll, you'll enjoy tonight's uh, study as we look at it. So we're looking at chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians and verses 6 through 10 that read like this. Yet we do not speak wisdom among those who are mature. We do speak. I keep saying not. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. A wisdom, however, not of this age, nor are the rulers of this age who are passing away. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, hidden, <clears throat> the hidden wisdom of God, predestinated before the ages to our glory. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age had understood. 
For if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. For to us, God revealed them through the spirit for the spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. Now, when we compare what Paul is writing in Corinthians very quickly with Romans chapter number 12, and uh, I'm going to read the verse to you, and verse number 2, all right, Romans 12, 2. Now, Dan has done a four or five week study on Romans chapter 12, which I thoroughly enjoyed and, and still am enjoying, all right, but it says here, and do not be conformed to this world this world now what do you perceive when the word world is used what's your perception of it anybody want to unmute and share well my perception is society all right and that's what we're talking about dan thank you very much all right it's society it's not the earth we live on okay it's society and do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So what we're looking at here is, not, is this, taking your mindset and placing it where God wants it to be instead of as we perceive the world society and mindset to be. Especially now, if we if we still continue to look at things in in terms of who this was written to, audience relevance, all right, which we'll show you here in, in a few minutes, because something happens to these people and their way of thinking, all right. And so when we see that, do not be conformed to this world, to the wor world's way of thinking, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, come over to Ephesians chapter four, please. Ephesians chapter number four. Okay. And let's notice verses 22, 23, and 24, I think is what we want. Here it says, <clears throat> that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self. Now the old self would be you know, we call it the old man, the old nature, but it's the one that follows the world's way of thinking, all right? The world's way of thinking, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit and that you be renewed in the spirit of what? Your mind. And isn't that what it says in Romans chapter 12, verse number two? Yes. All right. Be renewed here as, as we see that, okay? Uh, in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. Now, when you read Second uh, Corinthians chapter five and verse seventeen, if any man is in Christ, what is he? He's a new creature or a new creation. All right. So you put on the new self, that new creation. See, that new creation, which is in the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. So we get a new focus then in life, in the way we think, you see. And it's very, very important. As I spoke with the two young men today, I told them this. Listen, it's very important that you realize that the word of God is the key and not the thoughts of men, say. And that's how we have to look at things when people present to us thoughts that come out of the word of God. We, we don't automatic, automatically reject them or accept them. We go to the word of God to get understanding from them, okay? Get understanding from them. So to me, it's a wonderful. So <laughs> be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So that's what the plan of God is with all of us that have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, to have our minds renewed. Uh, now, some of you might, uh, uh, Brother Dan Kramer knows Dan Sheridan, all right? He's out of Chicago, 
and uh, he's on one of my Facebook people that, that I follow. And uh, uh, Dan's a writer, all right? And he's a very astute uh, uh, Bible student, by the way. But he had a post last week, and he posted this. What is a library? Okay, and I thought this was, this was great. What is a library? It's a hospital for your mind. That, and I thought that was a great thought. A library is a hospital for your mind. And so what's a library? It has books in it, right? Now we have the book, if you want to say that, the, the scriptures. And for whatever reason, a lot of Christianity is afraid to open the book, you know, to find out what it's, what it's all about there. Okay, so it's exciting. I guess is what I'm, I'm trying to say. So what happens is this, that Paul avoids then human uh, or the world's way of thinking when it comes to presenting the gospel, all right? Come on back to Corinthians with me if you're not there already, okay? And notice chapter 2 one more time in verse number number 5, if you would, where it says, so that your faith would not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So he refuses to water down the gospel, the message that brings men into a relationship with God, the world's way. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to put anybody down here, but Susan and I were saved through the ministries of fundamental Baptist churches, okay, uh, which praise the Lord, preach the gospel. But when it came time to uh, have individuals within the church become servants and uh, minister the word to people, in, in one church in particular, uh, they offered trips to Disney World and cruises, <laughs> okay, the folks that were going out and leading people to the Lord and bringing them back into the church and that sort of thing. And, and as I look at that now, we're, we're talking in, in, in my case, way back in 1970, 75, 76, you know, and it's just the way, you know, the church was being run in that aspect of advertising, just like the world does. And they were bypassing what I believe now uh, the power of God. It's the gospel, see? And and once a believer gets that in his heart and mind, then he has that desire to share it with other folks, okay? And doesn't have to be motivated by things of the world to do that. So that's just a thought. So what we have here is, is this. Notice verse number four, same chapter, chapter two. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Now, I believe that the wisdom he's speaking about, because he's going to continue to do that here, is the wisdom of the world. All right. So he wasn't going to take the wisdom of the world, mix it with the gospel and bring it to people. He, he was uh, relying on on a renewed mind and the power of God and the wisdom that comes from that. Notice verse six, yet we do not speak wisdom among those we do speak. You know what happens? In my Bible, that word not is right below. <laughs> At first, I keep saying not. Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. A wisdom, however, not of this age, nor the rulers of this age, who are passing what? Passing away. Now, what age are we looking at here? Now, we're in that age where the old and new covenant are running together, but the old covenant is slowly passing away here, all right? But these people that he's speaking about are living under the old covenant system, especially when we're talking about the Jewish leaders, all right? The, 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 the high priests, the priests, the rabbis, et cetera, et cetera. So, what is the problem here? Well, come on back to chapter 1, and let's read verse, verses 11 through 17, please. Yeah. All right, chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, verses 11 through 17. For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, 
by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Now I mean, now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one would say you were baptized in my name. Now I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptize any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. All right. And that goes right along with verse number four of chapter number two. So what the problem was here, and the reason Paul gets into this dissertation of wisdom, the wisdom of the world versus God's wisdom, all right, of an old age and of a new age coming, uh, is because these Corinthians had a fixation on status, all right, and competition, which kept them immature. They couldn't go on in their faith because they looked at men. In this case, as you see this, they looked at Paul and Apoll Apollos, Cephas, and even of, of Christ. And so they were putting men on pedestals. And so they were receiving their wisdom from what? From the idea of men in a worldly sense, because you and I are not to look at men in that, in that sense, which I'll show you in a minute, okay? Because Paul's desire was to share the deeper things with them, but as long as they had that Greek fixation, all right, of status, okay, and, and power among men, they weren't gonna get or, or arrive to the place of the wisdom of God. Notice with me uh, chapter three, please. <coughs> and let's read a few verses. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as the men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not able uh, to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not able, for you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you. Now think of this. What if, what if one of those Corinthians was following Paul, but another one was following Apollos? Apollos was a bright man and and paul commends him okay and someone else cephas or peter what was going on here all right jealousy as as we see this okay jealousy and strife were among them are you not fleshly are you not walking like mere men men of the world for when one says i'm of paul and another i'm of apollos are you not mere men you notice how he's repeating this thought, okay? What then is Apollos and what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. Notice that, God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building, all right? God's building as, as you see this. And so to me, it's a wonderment and you can see the problems that the folks in Corinth were having, the jealousy and strife, because they were following, instead of following Christ exclusively, you know, Paul, Apollos, Peter, say. So God's fulfillment promise about their future glory is involved in this. Paul puts it right in the middle of his dissertation. Uh, come on to chapter two again in verse number seven. And watch what he says here in verse seven. But we speak God's wisdom. Now, not the wisdom of the society, you know, and we'd say the Greek society there, in a mystery, a hidden wisdom, which God predestinated for the ages in our, uh, to our glory. Now notice, 
what wisdom is he speaking? God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden uh, wisdom which God predestinated before the ages for what purpose? For the purpose of our glory, right? Is that what he says there? And we need to understand that. Notice verse number nine again. But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard. So those are things that are visible, right? As we would say, and which have not entered into the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who do what? Who love him, for those who love him. Very important here as we see this. Now watch, come back to Romans 8. Now verse seven, uh, keep in mind, it's to our glory, all right, to our glory. Now I come back to Romans chapter number eight, and let's notice verses 16 and 17 and say this, the spirit himself testified with our spirit that we are the children of God. Well, praise the Lord for that. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so we may also be what? glorified with him. So there, there's this hidden wisdom that is going to be given to our glory. And then Paul says here, hey, the, the spirit gives testimony that you are the children of God. And more than that, you're going to be an error as long as you suffer with him. Okay. And as, as you read this, let's go to Ephesians 1. Okay. Let's continue to thought here. Ephesians 1, please. Here's two, here's chapter number one. Notice verses 13 and 14, if you would. Um, mm, yes, 13 and 14. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, we've talked about this in the last number of weeks. What is the greatest gift God gave you? It's his nature, right? Through his spirit. We saw that in Romans chapter number eight. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. So Paul's talking about glory to us and glory to God. If you back up to verse number 12, it says to the end that we who were first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. So our lives, as we walk on the face of the earth, I think we need to keep things in, in perspective and, and in mind. As we walk, there's a purpose in it. It's to his glory, okay, to his glory, and it's for our glory. So we have this inheritance, but watch this. Come to chapter 5, please, and verse number 5, where it says this, For this you know with certainty, that no immoral or impure person or covetous man, who is an idolater, has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. He's talking about believers here, okay? Uh when I was explaining to the to the young men about the universal reconciliation, the fellow that's a uh, Pentecostal, he said, "Well, I can go on sinning then, can I?" And if I'm if everybody's going to get saved, and I said, "No, you have to go back and read Romans chapter number six, right? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound?" Well, God forbid. All right, God forbid. And so this is something that people need to do what? They need to read about and they need to understand it. We have an inheritance because of what God's done through it for us through his, his spirit, okay? But it involves what? It involves walking and manifesting his glory, okay? It's to the glory of God, not to our selfish desires, even as uh, believers in Christ. So in, in, what happens here is this, in connecting the wisdom and maturity that Paul's desire for them is, okay? Paul has in mind something very definite. Now, Rosemary Hawkins, close your ears. 
<clears throat> I'm taking out another Bible. All right. It's the Orthodox Study Bible. And the Orthodox Study Bible has, it, it, it retains all the books that are in the Jewish Bible, all right, as the Old Testament covenant. They, they used to be in, in the King James Version when the original 1611 came out, but it was dropped after that. Now, what I'm going to go to is not Proverbs, but I'm going to go to the Wisdom of Solomon, okay? And I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but it, it, it's a good read to say the least. Then after that is the wisdom of Syriac, okay, a book, another book. But in chapter nine of the wisdom of Solomon in verse six, it says this, for though one is perfect among the sons of men, yet if your wisdom is absent from him, he will be regarded as nothing. Now that's a thought. So if one is perfect or mature, among the sons of men, yet if the wisdom of God is lacking, okay, he be regarded as nothing. Then over in verse 17 of the same chapter, it says this, who has known your counsel? Your is capitalized, so it's God's counsel. Unless you, God, have given him wisdom and set him and sent him your Holy Spirit from on high, see, and thus the paths of those on earth were made straight and mankind was taught with with what pleases you so they were saved by wisdom all right so even here you see in in the jewish scriptures all right uh this idea of wisdom in relationship to uh, a believers and the believer's mind okay renewing of the mind and allowing god's wisdom through the spirit of god and, and the word of god to to begin to dominate you, all right, as we see in Romans chapter 2. So what we find here then, that this Paul was able to give them divine wisdom, all right, divine wisdom because God's Spirit had inspired him. So he could pass on the wisdom to these dear folks in Corinth. So come on back with me one more time uh, to chapter number 2 of 1 Corinthians. And we've already read these, but let me read them again, plus one additional verse. So we're in, uh, where do I have you go? Back to chapter number two. Yes. And let's notice verse four and five again. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. So that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. I think if you did a detailed study here <clears throat> concerning this Paul about Paul's preaching okay now I'll just say this and take it for what it's worth it wasn't so much Paul being filled with the spirit as it was with what he was preaching that brought the power of God okay because Paul reaching out to an individual or a group of individuals being filled with the Spirit of God, well, praise the Lord, because he didn't, you know, he's the one that ultimately wrote it down for us, okay? But it, it's the words themselves that get into the hearts and minds of people, okay? Not Paul. Paul is what? He's a servant, as we read. One waters, you know, one sows, one waters, but it's God that gives the increase through through the word. Same for all of us. Yeah. yeah. So, so we keep that in mind. Uh, <laughs> and so verse 5, so your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now, watch this. Turn over to verse number 13 with me, same chapter. Here Paul says, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom. And as Brother Dan Kramer said to us, you know, the wisdom of society here, okay? But in those taught by the Spirit combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. And there it is. It's the thoughts that come from the scriptures, all right? And, and, and the words that you see here. Uh, this Sunday, I'm gonna talk a little, just a little bit about the Mishrash, which is a, a uh, Jewish commentary on the, on the Talmud. 
which is a commentary on the Torah, okay, the first five books. But as I've been reading that, okay, I even had Susan download something for me, you know, and print it out for me there. The Jews were intent, not just on thoughts of scripture, but on the words themselves and on the syllables found within the words, because their language, it, you know, it operates a little bit differently than, than ours. And I found it fascinating how they uh, put words together so they put thoughts together, all right, which gave us ultimately the Old Testament, you see? So it, it, it's very interesting, we'll, we'll take a look at that. But spiritual thoughts with spiritual words, and that's what Paul, Paul's whole idea here is. And what's, what's he trying to get to? Romans chapter 12, verse two, okay? And what we've seen here and over in Ephesians, the renewing of what? The mind with the wisdom of God through the power of God. It, that comes in the scripture, okay? So Paul speaks specifically uh, of the wisdom that it's not human wisdom, and we've seen that already in chapter two and verse number five, okay? But a wisdom that does not belong to this present age, verse number six that we've read three times already. So what we find then is this, come over to chapter seven with me, please. Chapter seven and verse number 31. In the present age that he's speaking about, that he's testifying here the gospel in, okay? Uh, there's a problem. And when we look at verse uh, 31, I believe is what I want. Yes, verse 31 of chapter 7. It says, and those who use the world, the society, as though they did not make full use of it. For the form of this world is what? Passing away. The earth isn't passing away, but the form of the world is passing away. The wisdom of that world is passing away, okay? And we go back to chapter two, <laughs> one more time. I keep flip flop. We'll have these memorized here, won't we? <laughs> yet we do not speak wisdom, or we do speak wisdom. I, I said it again. Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. Well, what wisdom? A wisdom, however, not of this age. That wisdom that is passing away with this age, chapter 7, verse 31, okay, as, as you see, not of this age, nor the rulers of this age, who are passing away. So it's passing away, the wisdom and the rulers of this age are passing away. They lacked, these folks that he's referring to, which I'll show you in a minute, okay, they lacked the eternal wisdom that God has for mankind, okay? It was predestined from before the ages, okay? To the glory of man, okay? At least those that, that believe. So, but ultimately, as we believe in universal reconciliation, everything else. Now, watch this, come back to Mark, if you would. Who are these folks he's actually talking about? And keep, keep your hand in 1 Corinthians, we'll come right back there the chapter one so let me get that back but notice mark chapter one and verse number uh, chapter 15 i'm sorry chapter 15 and verse number one here it says this early in the morning the chief priests with the elders and scribes and the whole council the sanhedrin here immediately held a consultation and binding Jesus, they led him away and delivered him to Pilate. So we're looking at the chief priests, we're looking at the elders, we're looking at the scribes, and the whole Sanhedrin is who you're looking at here. And they led him away after they bound him, delivering him to Pilate. Now turn over to verse 22, please. Okay, what is the result of this? Then they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. And they tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him 
and divided up his garments among themselves, casting lots for them to decide what each man should take. This was the soldiers, right? It was the third hour when they did what? Crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. That was a charge against him, the king of the Jews. Now watch this. What did these men do, the chief priests and the elders, okay, and the scribes and the Sanhedrin do? They delivered them over to be crucified. And we see that here in the crucifixion. But when I come back to chapter 1 and notice verse 23 of Corinthians, notice what Paul says. But we preach Christ what? Crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block and to the Gentiles foolishness. Who delivered them over to be crucified? The Jews did. Who actually did the crucifixion? The Gentiles did, right? But the point being this, they played right into the hands of God, as Peter says there on the day of, you know, uh, in, in chapters 2 and 3 of Acts. That this was God's plan, okay? And they, they followed right into it. So what did God use? He used their foolish wisdom, the wisdom of the world, to bring about a hidden wisdom that Paul talks about. So it's, it's, it's a sad situation that we see there, okay, on the part of these men. But what did Paul write about them? This age, this wisdom and this age is passing away, and so are the men of that age that did that, okay? So who do you have in mind? I call them the elite, the elite in the, you know, uh, of the Jews. It's almost like I spoke about Sunday uh, with uh, who was running the temple in Jerusalem at that time. It was the elites who was making all the money, the elites. And Jesus went in, cleansed it, all right? letting them know that this wasn't really theirs this is god's okay god the fathers so the elites that's what it was all about now let me turn to page number four to my notes okay so all these rulers then are doing what passing away first corinthians chapter 2 verse number six and what's happening here is that Paul is recalling the esteem, okay, that God brings and nullifies this sort of thing. Notice chapter 1, verse 28, 1 Corinthians, verse 28. And the base things of the world and the, dis and the despised, God has chosen the things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are. Well, in the context, what what was the things that are? Well, it was the wisdom of the world and these elite men. But God nullified them, see? He nullified them, okay? I mean, it's it's things that, you know, those that despised, that God just took care of it as you look at this, okay? So what we find is this, and Paul's example warns the status, conscious, Christian believers okay in chapter 1 verses 26 to 28 in other words they were you know looking at the stat status of men of the elites instead of paying attention to the word of god and what god is trying to teach them okay and in verses 26 to 28 one more time or consider your calling brethren that there were not many wise not many <laughs> A wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many mo uh, noble, but God has chosen what? The foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And if you'll remember back in the book of Acts when when John and, and uh, Peter were before the Jews, you know, were arrested, uh, they were amazed because of what? They didn't think they were learned men where they, they weren't learned as the elites were earned, you know. But of the elites, there were a number of men, 
Pharisees that believed in the Lord Jesus Christ beside Nicodemus. You know, they, uh, Paul says that. Okay, and you think of somebody like Gamaliel, who actually stood up for Paul, okay, who was one of his teachers, that, that we see that. So God didn't choose the high and mighty, did he? Or the worldly wise. No, he chose the lesser, just as our Lord Jesus Christ did uh, when he walked on the face of this earth. And that's encouraging, okay, encouraging, okay? So instead of honoring the true king, our Lord Jesus Christ, Okay, they embraced the foolish values of those who executed him. And look at it in, in this way. The, the Gentile believers looked at the elites and held them in esteem. And those are the kind of people that executed and crucified their savior. Okay, and as a result of that, they transferred the world's values now about leaders onto the leaders of the church let me read that again they have transferred the world's values about leaders onto the leaders of the church boasting in them notice chapter three one more time if you would okay chapter number three and let's read verses 19 through 21. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God. We just read this. For it is written, he is the one who ca catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise that they are useless. So then let no one boast in whom? Men. For all things belong to whom? To you, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas. Now, this is the third time he's mentioned these fellows' names. Or the world, or life or death, or things present, or things to come. All things belong to you, and you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to whom? God. So verse 1 of chapter 4 says, Let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Not a, a, as, as men who are to be lifted up like the world does, but as servants, say, of God. They aren't to be looked at as celebrities, let's put it that way, okay? And of course, you can go back to chapter four or chapter uh, three and verse four and read that again as, as, as we look at that, all right? So <clears throat> let me take you back to chapter one one more time, okay? And let's notice verses 10 and 12. Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, Chloe's people, they were the whistleblowers, that there are quarrels among you. Now what, ha what is the state of Christ general Christianity today? when it comes to something like this. And I've spoken about this, you know, in the last couple of weeks. The, the greatest hindrance to unity in Christianity is denominations. And Nick today asked me this. He says, now, Brother Dan, call me Pastor, Pastor Dan. <laughs> How many de denominations are there in the world? And I says, there's 30,000 plus denominations in the world. He says, let me correct you. There's 40,000 at least denominations in the world of Christianity. That's hard to believe. So why are there denominations? Because of jealousy and strife. And Susan just whispered to me pride. Mm -hmm. Say, and it should never have been. And, and you know, when actually, it started right back with Paul's day. Because there were those, remember, that followed after Paul, after he'd been somewhere. And then he had to write a letter to the Corinthians mm -hmm. to straighten some things out. But the Reformation, which was really a grand work with men trying to pull 
believers out of the Roman church, then what happened to that after a hundred years? Why well, follow Wesley? I follow Luther, say, and then you have other men. So you have the Presbyterians and the Methodists and the Lutherans and Baptists, the Anabaptists and all that sort of thing. It should never have happened in scripture, but why did it happen? I believe it happened, folks, because of immaturity and not following the scriptures and rather following an individual man, okay? No matter how great that man was, you know? I mean, we can learn from everybody and I don't put that aside, okay? We, we can learn for everybody. Uh, come back to chapter three again with me, please. <clears throat> And watch the warning here in, in, in verse verses three through nine. Okay. Three through nine, where he says this For you <clears throat> you are still fleshly, for since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly, and are you not walking like men, mere men? For when one says I am of Paul and another I am of Paulos, are you not mere men? What then is Apollos and what is Paul? servants through whom you believed servants through whom you believed but what did they believe the word all right even as the lord gave opportunity to each one let me stop here real quick because this just popped in my mind uh you know i i had the joy of of sitting uh with a gentleman at my home when i was in the military from uh, Trinity Baptist Church in Jacksonville, Florida. And I had been going to church for a year and a half, but I still, because of my Catholic upbringing, I was good enough, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. So I called the church office and uh, I said, would you send somebody over? I need to talk to somebody. So Jack Hines came over, just a great, great guy. He, he was a not too much older than me, maybe a year or two, but he had seven kids, you know, and he, he, he was just a dear servant of God. But he sat with me for a couple hours and, and we talked and we went through the scripture. And he showed me, Dan, it's not how good you are. It's how great God is. You have to see that. Mm -hmm. Now, here's ultimately what happened. So when I got transferred up to Upper Michigan from the ship in Jacksonville to a lighthouse in Upper Michigan, it was to give me a rest because I'd been seven straight years of, at sea. What, what happened was this, I got to witness to my, some of my brothers and sisters uh, in Erie, and behold, my youngest sister, uh, Danelle, uh, who happens to be about 17 years younger than I am, she had already been saved, and she was going to a street church, and we went with her once at Erie, downtown Erie, at a park where they, you know, they were all young people, and it was exciting to do that. But I got to share the gospel with my brother, Tim, and, and you all know brother, my brother, Tim, okay? And, and praise the Lord, Tim got saved. Then I got to sh share the gospel with my brother-in-law, Dwayne, and my sister, Gayla, okay? Now, uh, uh, Dwayne ended up going to Maslin Bible College in, in Ohio and became a church planter. You know, that was his ministry. But here's the story. My father, who was a devout Catholic, I don't know how many times I witnessed to him, gave him the gospel. My brother, Tim, did the same thing. My brother-in-law, uh, Dwayne, did the same thing, you know? And we, we gave him, the each one of us gave him the gospel through the word of God. But here's, here's what happened. One morning, my dad on a Sunday couldn't go to church because he was under the weather. So he turned on the TV. I can't remember his name, but here's a preacher from uh, Jack, uh, Orlando, Florida on TV of a super church. Later on, I got to be introduced to him. He took me for a tour. We, we, my dad took me up to a, a Wednesday night Bible study uh, and they had it in their cafeteria, which, which held 400 people. Okay. And so they fed the people because they came from work, right? To Bible study. And it was really a blessing that this fellow is a blessing. But here's my dad sitting watching and listening. And you know what went through his mind? No, this is the testimony he gave me. And he, he almost confessed it to me like it was a sin. He says, what I just heard was the same thing that my 
two sons and my son-in-law have been telling me for four or five years. And I finally understood it. So he got the message from the three of us as servants of God, and then from a fourth servant of God. And you know what he understood? The word that had been into him for those three or four years. So to me, it was a great pleasure, you know, to realize it's the word of God that's that's the power here that, that we see this. So let me continue, okay? So I plant verse six, I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. We're fellow workers with God. You are God's field, God's building, according to the grace of God, which was given to me like a wise master builder. I laid a foundation and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. Now watch what happens. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is whom? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Paul laid it. Apollos laid it. Cephas laid it. Dan, Tim, Dwayne laid it. Mm -hmm. You have laid it. Okay? But the foundation is not us as men as the Corinthian believers were thinking, looking at men. No, the foundation is Jesus Christ. And so what does Paul go into? I'm not going to read it all, but now he goes into what we call it the judgment seat of Christ. How things, you know, gold, silver, stone, okay, weeds and all that sort of thing as you read it, okay, talking about a man's what? Work. And the Corinthians, if they had a stand in judgment at this moment, before God would have everything blown, burned up. And why? Because they were putting their trust in men and not in, in the word of God and the wisdom that was being given by Paul. Does that make sense to y'all? Okay, as you see this. So I think it's very important that we understand that the judgment seat here, and what Paul writes about it, you know, if we want to call it that, what he writes about it comes in the context of God's wisdom, God's power in relationship to it being given to us as believers through his spirit and the word of God. OK, and the word of God. So it's really uh, <laughs> to me, it's a wonderment. So the point I think that Paul was making is the wisdom of this age is transitory. And that's what the Corinthians got caught up in, okay? What Paul is communicating is divine wisdom that was planned by God. Chapter 2 and verse number 7. <clears throat> but it was hidden from those who refused to believe. See, verses 6 and 8, okay? So, thus then we find... It was not discerned by sight, okay, or human imagination. Come back with me one more time here, and I'm, I'm going to close close up here pretty quickly. Notice with me 2, 9, chapter 2 and verse number 9. But just as it is written, things Amen. which eye has not seen, nor ear has not heard, and which have not entered into the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. It comes through the work of the Spirit of God. All right, and by the way, does anybody know where this quotation comes from? Two places here. Isaiah 64, 4 and Isaiah 65, 17. So Paul pulls Old Testament into his teaching here to show, hey, listen, it's for those that love God. So who do you love? The men you're uplifting or Jesus Christ, who is the foundation? Okay, who is the foundation? Now, watch what happens here in verse number 10. Be patient with me. For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit. Revealed what? 
the things that haven't previously been shared by God. Okay, all that God has prepared for those who love him, those things. So verse 10 again, for to us, God revealed them through the spirit, for the spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man, except the spirit of man, which is in him, question mark. Even so, the thoughts of God, no one knows, except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in the words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words, but a natural man does not accept the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised, as appraised as yet he had judged. But, who, but he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have what? The mind of Christ. And that's what we started with a number of weeks ago. See? And how do we say this? It's just the blessing. It's yeah. there. How do you take advantage of it? Within the scriptures. And we're not talking about doctrine here. What are we talking about? Character. See? That's what we're talking about. The character of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the foundation. And that's Paul's biggest concern for these Corinthian believers. They were following a wisdom of the world, a wisdom that was passing away along with the elites of the world that were teaching it. And he was showing them something that God hid, but now is made manifest. Foundation is Christ. And it's a wonderment. Okay, it's a wonderment. And it, it should be a joy to us. All right. So I'm going to close there. I want to thank you all for being here. Does anybody have anything they'd like to uh, say or not? Okay. Well, I got one uh, thing, Ken, and I might kind of off the subject there. You were talking about uh, those guys working for you and you wanted to reference them some books. Yes. Yeah. And do you, who, there was a book written by a, uh, one of our guys in Kentucky. Um, you know which one I mean? Um, one of the kind of concordant believers. Uh, yes, yes. I have it right over my library, and I can see it about escaping uh, something about hell. Yeah. The, the end of hell or something like that. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, it's right over there. Yeah, you only got one. Do you? Uh, that's like, all I got. <laughs> they, they published a truckload of those things. Yeah. And, and they're, as a matter of fact, I've got a a box of them here <laughs> oh do you yeah so you know I, maybe i'll try and bring them down to you sometime and when you come across somebody like that yes you can stick it right in their hand and um like i say i think there's uh, there's i think there's boxes and boxes of them somewhere yeah that if, if you can use them i think they'd be happy to you know get them to you Oh yeah, yeah, we'd, we'd be happy. Whenever. That'd be a yeah. good thing to publish on the website that we have and we could send them to folks. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. would be good. Yeah, yeah that's good. I, I was gonna give them uh, uh, Brother Pilkington's name and the salvation of all, okay, from the study shelf. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause that's, that's a very basic uh, yeah. uh, a book. You know, it's a good primer for someone to get started uh, in that. In fact, I, I mentioned to him, I says, uh, how many times did the Apostle Paul mention the word hell? Mm, yeah. <laughs> they, both, they looked at me like, well, he must have mentioned a lot. I mean, after yeah. all, he's the, you know, I asked him, who's the apostle to the Gentiles? And Olet knew that, you know, and I says, he doesn't mention it one time, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, uh, you know, there, there's a lot to it. And that's when Susan grabbed hold of uh, Nick. Yeah. And, and said, listen, get your concordance out and find out, get a definition of what real hell is. Yeah. I always like to ask them along similar lines, how many times is the phrase immortal soul found in the Bible? Yeah, right, right, yeah. No. You, 
I guess you got to have one of those things if you're going to burn forever. Yes. Yeah. 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 We talked about Adam, how he was created, you know, and that kind of stuff. But that's a good point, Dan. Yeah. So I always ask people this. Hey, listen, you take a 70 year old man that's a sinner uh, and not saved, you know, and he dies. So we put him in hell for eternity for 70 years worth of bad doings, you know. I mean, not even our court systems do that. Yeah. Or for that matter, a 15 year old kid. Yeah, yeah, kid, who, yeah. whoever it is. So, yeah. well, praise the Lord. Thank yeah. you, Dan. Listen, y'all keep Dan in prayer with Joanne, his wife. And uh, hopefully this, uh, you know, prayerfully this water thing, the fasting uh, will work and, and help give her a extended life here. Okay. And so we'll keep Dan in mind. Three weeks, Dan? That's, we're, we're, yeah, that's, that's the goal. <laughs> that's the goal. <laughs> Bless your heart. I have a hard time doing one meal fasting, you know, <laughs> but, uh, so praise the Lord. So you're in our prayers have been you and Joanne. So, so, uh, praise the Lord. God, God is good. But, uh, like we said, you know, and I, I told Dan this before that I thought often, you know, if I precede Susan or she precedes me, it's very temporary. Mm -hmm. We will be together, you know, uh, and I believe eternally. So praise, yeah. praise the Lord if you see that. So I'm going to let you all go and uh, uh, praise the Lord. We'll see you Sunday morning, uh, Lord willing. And that's when you're traveling, right, Dan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sunday. On. yeah. Okay. God bless you. Have a blessed week, rest of the week in the realm of the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. God bless Amen. you. Amen.